Welcome to the webinar on the Turn Oakland County Green Campaign. Um, we're here to talk about a climate plan that's been developed by a group of uh, environmental and social justice advocates that will seriously reduce the carbon footprint in Oakland County and give the county an opportunity to be a leader in addressing climate change. If you're a member of Birmingham Unitarian Church, and you are, um, you're probably aware of a campaign we've been uh, running this year for a climate change resolution. And I want you to know that this project is entirely different. Both are about climate change and I'm involved in both of them, but otherwise they're, they're two different things. Um, we have heard again and again from various experts that the best way for us to have an impact on climate change is to get involved locally. And I jumped at this opportunity to do this. <clears throat> With a recent change in leadership in Oakland County, as you know, in the last year or so, um, there's a, a change in openness to addressing climate change here in the county, and so we're taking advantage of that. So first I want to introduce the team, and I'm just going to introduce the team members that are here. Um, I, as I've said to all of you before, one of the reasons I have hope that we can fix this problem is the, the, the energy and the passion and the intelligence and the um, accomplishments of the people who are working on it, uh, young people and older people. These are two young people. Andrew Sarpolis is a senior organizing representative with the Sierra Club, where he's worked since um, 2013. He's been working on their Beyond Coal campaign to replace our carbon intensive energy grid with sustainable forms of power. He's already recruited municipal leaders in several Michigan cities and is now putting Oakland County in his sights. Andrew has a degree in political science from Grand Valley State University and a bachelor's in economic relations from the University of Economics at Krakow and is working on a certificate in nonprofit leadership from the Harvard Kennedy School. Meredith Gillies began working with Clean Water Action in the summer of 2016 as a can and she is now, she's risen to the position of campaign organizer. Uh, Meredith has a BA in Women's Studies and Sociology with a concentration in Law, Justice, and Social Change from U of M. Um, on the team is also Fred Miller, who's a retired attorney, uh, who's been an activist for many years. Marnice Jackson with Mothers Out Front and also represents the NAACP Environmental Justice Team. And um, Grover, I'm sorry, these are out of order. Grover Easterling, who is a field organizer with the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. So it's a pretty, um, pretty impressive team. And then there's just, this is just me on the team. Um, I'm just honored to be able to work with these folks. And um, I think they're all terrific. Here we all are at a meeting with Dave Coulter, March 12th. It was the day before everything really got locked down. So, um, I don't, I don't think you can see my cursor. Here's Meredith and here's Andrew and Dave Coulter and me and um, some other folks. So um, the other thing I wanted to share was the, here's a graphic that um, kind of lays out the whole plan. So there's climate, clean water, energy, justice, and transition, transit and transportation. And underlying all of this is democratic access. Several of us on this call right now worked on the Voters Not Politicians uh, campaign for Proposal 2 and gerrymandering a couple of years ago. And my motivation for working on that was that we're not going to fix climate change if, we, if our votes don't count. We have to get the right people in office. And in order to do that, all of our votes have to count. So democratic access is key to all of these things happening. Um, but first on the topic, sorry to jump around like this, is um, climate and emissions. So we're gonna talk about each one of these things. Here's a little bit more detail, uh, but we're gonna, I'm gonna ask the team members to go through these. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about, there's a, oh, I wanted to tell you this document I will send out to you after the meeting. This is a lot more detail about the plan. This one on the left is more you know, the uh, important bullet points. Um, but at BUC, we've been hearing about climate change for the past year plus. 
We've had Neb Durek, Julia Cole, Paul Clement, Paul Gross. We get it. We know climate change is happening. We know how bad it is. So I don't want to spend time on that tonight, but I want to start by talking about climate and what the Oakland County Climate Plan will do to address it. So now I'd like to hand it over to Andrew. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Jane. Um, I just want to give a huge shout out to Jane because she's been volunteering so much time on our campaign and has really been instrumental in doing a lot of the um, work that we're doing, including putting this presentation together, but also designing our logo, setting up all sorts of documents, helping to, um, you know, she's helping to put together a newsletter. And uh, I just want to stress that that's really important. Um, we're really trying to build, you know, if I can just give a little context quickly on the climate movement um, and the political landscape, uh, although I won't go into it too much, it's that we're in a place right now that's really new for Oakland County. Really, you know, since the establishment of the county, um, we have not had great leadership um, for many, many, many years. And for the first time, you know, really that I, I think anyone's been around for, we have a majority that is interested in climate solutions. And that's very exciting, but it's also something that we have to not take for granted because there are many, many issues out there uh, that the county commission can focus on. And, you know, they don't know if they're going to have a majority uh, come November and they don't know what the future is going to be. They might hold on to some seats, they might lose seats. And what we want to kind of do is lift up climate as um, something that is important and something that Oakland County does care about um, because we think that this is a moment, you know, we see the research number one coming out. Um, I, I'm sure folks have all been watching this last summer and um, in 2019, as we had fires in California, as we had Australia was on fire, we had record Antarctic ice melt. Um, so we know that a lot is going on our planet, which is very troubling and it's starting to accelerate. Um, here in Oakland County, we have a quarter of the state's GDP. We have a research university which has academics uh, in environmental health and many other renewable energy and many other topics um, that can provide expertise and guidance and um, capacity. And we have a very large population. So, you know, Oakland County is the place where it can happen. And what we're trying to do politically, so we're going to talk about climate here um, as one of the presentation planks. What we're trying to do is put in place an infrastructure uh, that will start to set us down the right path. We know we're not gonna get everything we need uh, by November, but what we can do is start to build offices uh, by demonstrating popular support and policies that the county can start to carry out. And um, once they're in place, it's gonna be much harder for people to go back and attack them and remove them. Uh, so I wanted to, start with the climate piece and just talk a little bit about some of the things that are in the platform and why we're proposing them. And I don't know, Jane, if you wanted to pull back up the, um, the slide there. <laughs> Lots of slides. There we go. Well, oh, it's on the right one. There you go. Perfect. Um, so yeah, number one thing we want to do um, on the climate front is establish a sustainability office. One thing I think people will realize if they read this platform is there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done, you know, and there's a lot of details in this. Everything I think is, you know, when we talk to the public, we make things as simple as we can so we can appeal to a broad audience. So we talk about some very general dates like 2050. We'll talk about, you know, wind and solar. But when you actually start to dig into a lot of like, how does that get implemented and um, you know, all of the complexities around it, it becomes very clear that this is not the kind of thing that you're gonna do and has indeed never been really done at a governmental level without somebody to provide uh, sort of a clearinghouse for information and coordination between departments. So we are pushing for a sustainability office because if we don't have a sustainability office and what Oakland County has had in the past is an ad hoc um, system 
where every department is not talking to one another, one another. building managers are not talking to the people they need to be talking to. No one is keeping track of the energy usage and the emissions. And when you're in a scenario like that, um, you know, you're not going to achieve much progress. So we need an office to do it. Detroit has an office. Um, Ann Arbor has an office. Ferndale was a pioneer with uh, their office in terms of local municipalities. Um, pretty much all the, le the county leaders we look to in the nation, Cook County and uh, King County, they all have coordinated offices. So that's one thing that we feel is really important. The commission has told me that they can't get an office by November probably, but they could get an officer. Um, I think that's still a good step in the right direction and something we can expand on. Um, we want county operations net zero by 2030. We want the county to set a model. Um, and 2030 is more aggressive than the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's recommenda recommendations, but we believe that the county has the ability to do in much the same way Ann Arbor is doing, um, practice leadership, right? So Ann Arbor is committing a billion dollars to make all of their operations 100% renewable in the next decade. And we believe that uh, Oakland County can definitely do that too. Um, and Ann Arbor is also, so our third point, committing to net zero and 2050 is the target date um, that we wanna see. And that's something we absolutely believe Oakland County can do as well. Um, a lot of people say, well, maybe it's not, maybe it's a soft landing or something. Net zero locks us into two degrees Celsius warming and, or sorry, 1.5 degrees Celsius warming versus two degrees Celsius warming, which is what a lot of people were pushing for earlier. And it might not sound like a lot, but I just want to stress that um, that 0.5 degrees Celsius difference is uh, the difference between most of the coral reefs on earth dying and all of the coral reefs on earth dying and several uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of potential economic damage. So net zero by 2050, we want a 1.5 degree Celsius rise at most on our planet. And preferably if we can do it better, that's a floor, but if we can be more aggressive, I think we should absolutely push for it. Um, and we get there with renewables and energy efficiency, not with, um, you know, these other policies that are being tried by DT Energy right now, um, where they're gonna allegedly bottle all of our natural gases emissions and build new nuclear plants and all that. That's not what we need. Um, and I can go into that maybe a little more later, but th those are false solutions. And the, the technology is not there, um, whereas wind and solar are performing and generating massive amounts of energy right now for, for everybody. So. You want to go to clean water? Yeah, Meredith, you want to take clean water? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, we thought it was really important to include clean water as one of the pillars um, of this platform. Um, and I think that uh, sometimes people think of a lot of water issues as sort of separate from climate change. Um, and, uh, you know, we really believe that with, you know, this platform is something that's striving for climate justice. Um, and you really can't have that without clean water. Um, but also climate change is really intimately tied to our water quality and our water cycle. So, you know, as you see here on the slide, um, some of the impacts of climate change, like more storms and um, surface waters warming um, and overflows, our infrastructure will be overloaded as storms get stronger and more frequent. Um, you know, that will change our water quality and lead to algal blooms and fish contamination. And it's, it's already happening. Um, we're already seeing more algal, toxic algal blooms than we have before in the Great Lakes. Um, we're already seeing the levels in the Great Lakes rising, um, which has serious implications for our ecosystems. Um, and we're already seeing uh, increased rainfall every year, which is uh, leading to uh, more combined sewer overflows, leading to more E. coli into our water. So there are a lot of direct tie-ins. 
Um, so, you know, obviously we believe that affordable clean water is a human right. Um, and our water infrastructure uh, is in deep need of revi revitalization and repair, um, especially in poor communities um, with older housing. But just in general, um, you know, we have water infrastructure all across the state that has not been replaced in 100 years. Um, that's why we still have so many lead pipes, um, but it's, you know, beyond that, our sewer systems are not prepared to deal with the amount of uh, precipitation that we're going to be seeing as climate change, you know, continues um, putting more pressure on water infrastructure. Um, and, you know, we're going to see more flooding and that also increases pollution, increases runoff pollution. So um, these things are really intimately tied. Um, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, some of the things that are included in the plan. Um, so replacing lead service lines. Um, obviously, that is a huge, um, you know, when we're talking about justice, having drinking water that's not contaminated is probably one of the most basic tenets of um, a just society. Um, and, you know, we uh, really believe that the county should be prioritizing most vulnerable customers. Um, the areas that are testing with the highest lead levels should be replaced first. Um, and uh, stormwater utilities. Um, so, uh, you know, we want, the, we want to make sure that if you implement storm utilities, they are implemented in such a way that it does not put undue burden on communities that cannot afford it. Um, but stormwater utilities are a, a really great way. They've, uh, they've been implemented in a lot of communities before um, and have shown good success rates of, you know, creating a fund that can be used um, on other projects um, and also creating an incentive for folks to, uh, you know, uh, get rid of their surfaces that cause more runoff pollution. Um, and, you know, investing in green infrastructure, native plants, um, you know, we need to be thinking differently about the kinds of infrastructure that we have. Um, and then the last one, which uh, we've already made some headway on, um, is passing a sanitary code. So uh, Oakland, um, so uh, in Michigan is the only state in the country that does not have um, a sanitary code um, requiring septic owners to uh, inspect their ex inspect and maintain their septic tanks. Um, and as a result, we have really high E. coli contamination, um, which is uh, you know a problem for public health. Um, and so we have been pushing Oakland to um, be a leader and pass their own sanitary code to you know be an example for the rest of the state. Um, sort of you know, a smaller example of what we're hoping to do with this platform. Um, and they have passed a resolution urging the state to pass a code, um, which would be ideal, but uh, you know, they have committed to working on their own code if the state fails to pass something, which um, we definitely expect. Um, so yeah, that's the clean water portion of the platform. Awesome. Um, so who wants to take energy justice? I'll, uh, I'll do that. Okay. All right. So um, I think I talked about this a little bit, but, you know, the, the problem with transitioning, so there are, like I said, there are many false solutions to the, the climate change problem that we have right now. I think that you know, one of the things we have to be really careful of in any transition, and we can look back through history uh, you know, and see other transitions and how they played out, the Industrial Revolution, the Information Revolution, whatever it is, uh, there's a co very common theme of people getting left behind in a lot of those cases. And the Energy Revolution, I have no doubt, um, will be every bit as disruptive um, as some of those other res re revolutions, especially um, if we have, since we've waited so long and we have so much to do so quickly. Um, you know, this is something that's basically saying we've got an energy one way for a hundred plus years, and now we're going to do it some other way. We built our entire, um, grid on the idea that we were going to have these large 
monopoly utilities. They were going to have these big plants and they were going to take energy from that plant to your home and it was going to be a one-way transaction. Um, you know, and that was going to be that. And we've started to move to a system of wind and solar. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity in that, but there's a lot of threat as well. Um, one of the threats is that, you know, energy wealth can be more spread around um, when you use wind and solar. If you put solar on your house and you pay off the cost of the panels, but you're still getting energy, you are building wealth. You know, you're not paying for something that you would have otherwise had to pay for. You're getting, um, you know, you're creating something. And so, you know, the same with wind to a lesser extent, it's harder to deploy on the home level, but we see farmers, right, that put wind on their properties and they're getting money to help stabilize their business so that in down years, um, you know, they've got that extra income to fall back on. And so we see um, the opportunity to provide justice to a lot of people. We also see, um, you know, our homes consuming energy. Many older houses are less efficient. And a lot of uh, times when we make investments in a house to make it efficient, um, that also builds wealth because that is, you know, you're paying for something, but you're, in the long run, you're actually going to make more money off of those investments um, in better insulation, um, you know, restricting the flow on faucets, showers, whatever, than, than the cost of putting in the infrastructure. So one of the questions gets to be, how do we make sure that um, energy is not just something that the rich are benefiting from, but something that everybody in society is benefiting from? And that's where the concept of energy justice comes in. Um, you know, I think you know, a lot of technologies tend to get adopted by more affluent people first, and electric cars you know, are certainly an example of something that if access is not carefully considered, may benefit some communities and not others, and especially not those, those that need it. Um, you know, Detroit area is probably gonna be a pretty late adopter of electric cars if the market is just allowed to, to do whatever. But the air quality on those, around those freeways is some of the worst is in that area. And then you have all those industries on top of it. So where the most benefit is, um, is sometimes where the least access to technology is possible. And so when we design policies uh, for energy and how we're going to get our energy in the future. It's not just enough to build solar panels. You know, DT went out and built um, solar panels on the O'Shea Solar Park in Detroit. The residents in that neighborhood get nothing from that transaction except that there are now solar panels out in front of their porches, you know, but the, it's billed by certain people as being a big benefit to the community. But I think it's a very good example of, um, you know, not citing things well. The land was free. The city of Detroit gave it to them for free, basically, through an agreement. And people got nothing for it. So we need to be responsible about how we cite energy. And we need to recognize that many of these communities uh, that have the least access to technology also have the highest burden they're paying the most as a percentage of their income in energy bills. So energy is a huge expense for them and they're not getting the access to the technology to mitigate it. So what we've done in this platform is tried to look at um, low income communities, communities of color um, that are maybe not serviced by these technologies and asking the county, please, when you design your programs, um, make sure that those people have access through grants, through loans, through special uh, you know, programs, however they may be designed so that they're building wealth in their communities and that they're benefiting um, and that their air is cleaner because you know, if we don't have to use as much energy, we also don't emit as much. And we know that many of these energy facilities are sited in minority communities. So if they're burning less fuel, they're also cleaning up the air and leading to less incidents of asthma. Everything's connected <laughs> in a really, in a really incredible and powerful way. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what that's about. And uh, we're also asking the county to be an advocate. Um, county has been pretty quiet on DTE and what they've been doing at the Michigan Public Service Commission. That's not the case for everybody. Mayor of Royal Oak has been outspoken, Mayor of Ferndale, 
has been outspoken, Pleasant Ridge, Ann Arbor, they've all gotten involved in these proceedings at the state. And what we are asking now is for Oakland County to be an advocate at the state. Ann Arbor's already out there saying a lot of what I'm saying right here to the state and saying the state needs to act on this. And we wanna see Oakland County be taking leadership. We don't want, you know, I'm, I'm a little sick, honestly, of Ann Arbor. <laughs> They're always the ones doing it first, right? Like, let's, <laughs> let's uh, give someone else a chance and that can be us, so. Okay, so next is uh, transit and transportation. Yeah, I think we were gonna alternate, so I can take this one, but if Andrew has anything to add, please uh, feel free, because this is stuff I'm not, not my area of expertise. But um, yeah, so uh, transportation is uh, the single biggest uh, emitter of um, uh, greenhouse gases. Um, as far as all of the different sources, um, transportation as a whole is the biggest contributor. So um, that obviously has to be a really big, important part of our climate plan for that reason. Um, but it also is intimately tied to justice, um, especially in Oakland County. Um, if, uh, you know, there are huge numbers of folks that commute either within Oakland County or into Oakland County for work. Um, and, you know, a lot of those jobs become inaccessible if someone doesn't have the means to get to them. Um, and public transportation is a huge part of that. So, um, we, you know, in our platform advocate for public transportation, um, as well as bike trails and, you know, just encouraging low carbon um, and shared use mobility. Um, so any transportation uh, model that, um, oh, yes, I promise we are, we're almost done with the presentation and then we will be focusing on questions and everything. Um, I'll make sure to go fast. Um, and, uh, you know, linking Woodward Avenue, uh, you know, through bike and walkability, uh, that's a really um, essential step to uh, increasing access within the county. Um, electric vehicle charging stations, more infra infrastructure for that. Um, and we definitely believe there needs to be a moratorium on widening roads um, until there's, uh, you know, maintenance funding set aside um, and high occupancy vehicle lanes. So um, I think that's the only slide on transit. Okay. Is there another one? Uh, the last the last slide is democratic access. Uh, I guess that means it's Andrew's turn. Yeah, and I'll be quick. I'm sorry. I'm also talking very long. <laughs> so this might be re re repeat information for a lot of folks. So um, I mean, I'll just say, I, I don't know about everybody else, but um, I think I certainly appreciate the importance of democratic process. Uh, more than I ever have in my life watching a lot of what's going on nationally. Um, and I think it's really important. You know, it, I like the way Jane visualized this as a foundation rather than a pillar because I think it, um, I think that it, it, it underscores that, you know, environmentalists win when we have access to the ballot box, when people have access to the ballot box and when votes are not being um, repressed or suppressed in any way. Um, so we wanna make sure that that vote is open and that access is easy and that information is clear. And so we are calling on the county to protect our environmental rights by protecting our voter access rights. Um, and yeah. Okay, so um, we've talked every time we meet about campaign action steps, but um, I want to spend time answering folks' questions on the platform. I will send this all out to you later. Here's where you can go to sign the petition. Um, I'll send you a copy of the platform. So I'm gonna stop sharing so we can all see each other and you can ask questions um, to Andrew and Meredith about the platform itself if you want to. Do you want us to just jump in if we have a question, sure. Jane? Go ahead. Unmute okay. yourself. Um, okay. So can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, I have one question for Andrew and one for Meredith. 
but before I ask my questions, I just want to say I attended the uh, meeting, the kind of town hall meeting that was held at Birmingham Unitarian Church a couple months ago. And that night I got really excited because of the number of times and the way you incorporated the need to recognize inequality and inequity in this work. I was so impressed by that and really uh, inspired by that. So I really thank you for incorporating that into this, into this process. <clears throat> and then uh, my questions are these. Um, for Andrew, you know, we hear the year 2050 and at the same time, we're hearing really credible experts saying we have about 12 years to, um, to you know, to, to get, to take out that 1.5 degrees or we're going to have serious trouble. So I, I'm curious to hear your comments about that difference in the time frame. Um, and then Meredith, my question for you regarding water is, do we have many water shutoffs in Oakland County? And if so, where has that occurred? And if you have information, can you share what's being done to help people in the meantime? Great. Uh, well, yeah, I, so I'll go first and thank you. Yeah, I think it's a really important question. My understanding, so the 12 years, the way I've seen that in the media is from the IPCC recommendations, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, I think so we had 12 years to take serious action. And what that means, so I, I, I dug a little bit into the report, what that means according to the IPCC, and I can't speak for anyone else because there may be other scientists that I'm not aware of saying it in a different context. But what I understood the context of that report to be was they said, I think it was a 45% reduction within 12 years. So their thing was we need, we have 12 years to take significant action stops. Um, but I do want to put a caveat into that because that is given the assumption that every nation acts, you know, on the timeline that they're supposed to, which I think is a pretty, um, ambitious assumption. I, I've actually been doing a lot of reading on um, climate treaties and other stuff because a lot of the protocols that I'm trying to learn to advise Oakland County, um, a lot of it was developed in the treaties from the 90s and 2000s and stuff. And, you know, one thing I've learned reading about those treaties is that they're very easily broken and there's not a lot of enforcement mechanisms. So I think there is an argument. Um, like I said, 2050 is a um, scientific recommendation if everybody pitches in, but I think there's a very good argument and folks like Sunrise have made it that wealthier countries should be doing more um, than that. And I certainly am not opposed to doing that. I think we should set up, I think politically, we should set a floor of 2050, um, but I think we should continue to push um, the county to be more aggressive than that. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the faster the United States does this as one of the largest emitters, um, the better situation we're going to be in so yeah all right all right thank you yeah and um for the water question so um yeah great question so uh, as far as i know um uh oakland county actually i think a few 2016 or 2017 um implemented uh i just have the name pulled up uh the water residential assistance program um and so that uh helps folks in um, uh, quite a few communities in Oakland County pay for water bills. Um, and so as far as I know, there's not a huge number of water shutoffs in Oakland County. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the data for, I, I'm sure there are some, but um, I don't know where they are. Um, a, a big part of that is because that data uh, isn't readily available um, in a lot of ways. So um, for example, People's Water Board, um, which is a, a coalition in uh, Detroit that has been working on water affordability and shutoffs um, for years. Um, they are currently in the process of um, making FOIA requests to try to find the addresses of all of the people um, who have had their water shut off. Um, it's not just like readily publicly available, you have to go through FOIA. Um, uh, but they, that request was denied um, by the Detroit Water and Sewage Board um, because they said that it was a privacy issue to, um, you know, uh, give people's addresses that have had their water shut off, um, which is BS, quite frankly. Um, and uh, it's been actually really disappointing to see. 
um, how that uh, agency has been handling uh, the water shutoff crisis right now. Um, but yeah, so as far as I know, there's not a ton in Oakland County. Um, the places where it's um, the highest numbers are obviously Detroit and then Flint as well and Saginaw. Um, all of those I know have over a thousand um, houses without water right now. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware of anywhere in Oakland County that has large numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it just occurred to me that I can call my city clerk's office or call the, yeah. call our city utility office and ask. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. Just that's, see. A great, that's a great <laughs> thing to do. Um, yeah. um, can, can I ask a question about that? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jim Nash is quite friendly on sustainability issues. Would he be a good source? I, I think so. He's the Open yeah. County Water Commissioner, and he's very friendly to sustainability. Yeah, he definitely is. I yeah, I think he'd be a great resource. Um, uh, yeah. I, now, my other my other question was was moving towards action. The structure of your advocacy. Do I understand that Andrew and Meredith are the organizers, and if we had an office, you would be in it? Is that correct? If we did get our desire for having a locale, uh, and then uh, you would be uh, putting pressure on the the uh, friendly county commissioners working with you, and the unfriendly, if we want to call it that. I don't want to, I don't want to be too too bipartisan or anything here. I, mean, I do want to be bipartisan, but then then there would be pressure put on the commission, and then how would people like us at the church? Uh, fit into that through Jane, right? Through Jane coming up with actions? I'm just trying to see what the road to action is here. That's a great question. Andrew, do you want to, I can... Uh, go ahead, if you have something. Yeah, I mean, so, um, great question. So obviously um, it has, you know, changed a little bit for during this time um, because, you know, oh, yeah. limitations. Um, uh, so for right now, it's really about um, getting the word out and building the base of support by uh, getting signatures on the um, online petition, which basically is just a, a statement of support of the platform. Um, and so uh, we have a social media guide, which I definitely encourage. I know Jane's going to send an email after. I assume you'll include that as well um, so that y'all can, you know, share it um, and not just on your pages, but in any groups that you're in, you know, Facebook groups are a great place to share things like that. Um, but also, you know, talking to all of your family and friends about it. Um, so that's like the, the main thing that's happening right now, um, uh, you know, as we're all in, you know, in our homes. Um, and then, but outside of that, you know, once we are able to, you know, go outside and gather again, um, tabling at events in the community and getting those signatures is huge. Um, the other thing that can be done both now and later is um, meeting with your county commissioner and also encouraging other um, community members to do the same. So what we really need, you know, we need to put pressure on those county commissioners and the best way to do that is if they're hearing from their constituents. Um, and it makes, you know, a lot more difference if a constituent, you know, schedules a meeting with a commissioner and has a conversation with them, tells their personal story of why climate change is important to them, um, you know, why equity and justice is important. That's going to make a really, that's what really makes an impact on commissioners. So, so were we as a campaign going to be arranging those meetings with commissioners or do you want people to do that on their own? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, I think we can, I think both would be my answer. Like we absolutely can help folks set up meetings if they would like that. And we are happy to, um, you know, go with them or, uh, or coach them on uh, talking points, not coach, but you know, talk, talk, talk through talking points first, if they'd like that, you know, I think we'd be happy to do that. You have, you have some people on this call who are quite proficient at meeting with legislators and <laughs> and doing those sorts of things. Um, and some who would, you know, want someone to come with them, so. Yeah. Um, uh, um, I would suggest from my work with Citizens Climate Lobby, where we meet one-on-one -on -one with our, at essentially our House of Representatives Federal, that we maybe work on trying to organize 
so that each commissioner has a, I, we call it a liaison, so that there's a point person so that they're not getting bombarded. And that might be something we could do while we're homebound, you know, is kind of look at where's the list of commissioners, who's been interested on various calls and events, and can we get people to step up to do that? Because I would imagine even during this time, it might be okay to even send the commissioners an email saying, you know, yeah. although, you know, there's very important things happening now that take precedence, we don't want to forget uh, that this is a goal that we're trying to help Oakland County achieve. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so Karen, you're, you're still in my thunder here because that's yeah. where I was, I was just about to go. Um, <laughs> But I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, we we are actually looking for people right now to be, you know, I, I guess precinct captains might not be the right word, but district captains or whatever you would say, people that can, um, you know, we've got different county commission districts here in Oakland County. Um, we're not like in an at-large situation. So we're asking for people, if you live in a district um, and you want to be that person or you want to be a co-lead with someone else um we're absolutely that's one of the main things we're looking for because so just to give you an idea of where we're at in the campaign um and meredith kind of got this a little bit we're in a um presentation and signature collection phase um you know the crisis is obviously uh taking a lot of our government's focus and time but we can we can continue to organize so that when uh, that crisis is over, that we're in a good position to uh, continue doing what we're doing. And so part of that, I think, is paving the way, you know, that once these commissions are back to regular meetings, that we can get this on the agenda early and we can get this on the agenda uh, in a way where we have the votes. And I think having meetings through Zoom uh, or some other method of reaching out to your county commissioners over the next month and a half is going to be really, really critical to that. I don't know where you all live, but you know, there's a special couple of commissioners in particular that we need to make sure are on board and we need them not to, the thing is they can hear it from the Democrat caucus. Like Dave Woodward can tell them you need to vote this way, but it's going to be a hell of a lot more powerful if it's also coming from their own constituents. So in both directions. And who would those commissioners be, Andrew? Um, I, I'd have to look back at the list. Meredith, do you remember some of them? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess it depends on what you're talking about, because there are some commissioners that um, are champions on this issue and are um, vulnerable. So, the person who comes to mind is Kristen Nelson, who might be the most um, environmentally inclined commissioner um, and is also in a very vulnerable seat and, and very possibly could lose her seat in 2020. Um, so, you know, we definitely uh, want to like put attention on her as someone championing this platform. Um, but then as far as folks who need uh, uh, persuasion, um, I think uh, Angela Powell was one um, we had talked about. And some of these aren't even necessarily persuasion, it's just education. Um, you know, each each commissioner, they're just, you know, they're just people. And so they they have knowledge on some areas and, and maybe are not as knowledgeable in others. So I know Angela Powell's one. Um, I think McGillivray and Miller we talked about as well. Um, and then there are a few, there are some Republicans that are potentially movable, um, Kokenderfer, is one, he is on the Healthy Communities and Environment Committee as well. So he's oh. on the important committee. Um, so he's definitely one that we'll wanna put pressure on. Um, I know there are others, but that's just off the top of my head. Yeah, um, and I don't... I was gonna say, speaking for Karen and me, we're trained in ways of not putting pressure, but respectfully approaching Republicans and and opening a conversation that is not a blaming one, et cetera, et cetera. I hope you have some coaching with that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and trying to find common ground right. is what it is. You know, um, we live in a lakes area with lots of outside venues. You know, everybody should be concerned about this. Mm -hmm. And that maybe is some of the common ground. Yeah, I think that's so important. And, um, you know, I just want to say as well, folks shouldn't, 
feel intimidated. Some of you sound like you're veterans at this, so I'm not, <laughs> you definitely aren't uh, probably intimidated by the idea of doing a lobby meeting, but if there's anyone out there that is, I just want you to know, like, we've got plenty of resources. I mean, we've got the, to the toolkits that we're working on. We've got uh, lobby documents. We're welcome to train you one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, if that's something you feel you need support with, we're happy to be in meetings with you. Um, and we have a list of, you know, almost, I think about 50, 60 volunteers all across Oakland County. There's probably a couple others in your district. So you don't even have to go out and organize, you know, a meeting all by yourself. You, you'll have other people we can connect you with who can plug in, um, you know, so in a lot of ways, uh, you know, we want local folks to help facilitate, but we want to be like there to support, you know, every step of the way. Mm -hmm. Meredith, do you mind saying again the name of the Healthy Communities and Something Something Committee? Healthy Communities and Environment. Okay, because uh, Adam Kokenderfer is my commissioner. Oh, great. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, for sure. Another I question. have a few questions. Uh, Andrew, for you, renewable renewables. Um, what year would you expect Oakland County to be 100% renewable? Um, who are you talking about and what are the renewables that make that? Um, yeah, so I mean, like I was kind of saying, 2050 is the date that we need to be what's called net zero. Um, and I do wanna acknowledge that that's a very unspecific term and there are, like I could have an hour conversation probably about the nuances of that term, which I don't want to get into, but I think, you know, just to be as candid as possible and simplifying a little bit, you know, we want to see wind and solar. Realistically, a lot of that, I don't know what our wind resources will be. I know there's plenty of room for um, solar here in the county. Um, and indeed there already is solar here in the county. Uh, so, DT actually, their IRP was rejected. Um, IRP is an integrated resource plan um, and it's something the utilities have to file, uh, you know, kind of does their 15 year planning. So they went back to the drawing board and they found out, you know, after they were told they didn't do enough for renewables, they found out they could build way more solar than they, they were saying they could build before. So it's definitely viable here in Michigan. Um, and I think that, you know, what we're trying to do is get to that 2050 timeline uh, so that, you know, if we have, if the energy is renewable, it will also be 100% net zero. You know what I'm saying? If we can, if we can power 100%, even though there are nuances between those two terms. And I'm not sure, what was the second part of your question? Because I'm not entirely sure I understood. You, you answered it basically. Um, the, um, the technology does not exist today to get renewables 100% at any year unless you include nuclear. But between now and 2050, hopefully there's some scientific and engineering um, happenings that will get us at least closer to that. And I think it's important to, um, to push towards 100%. I don't personally think, like I say, that it's that it's possible with today's technology. But let me let go of that one for a minute. I'm gonna go over to Meredith and I'm gonna talk about the water situation. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the utilities that any person requires would include water, gas, electric, and some people would throw in a telephone. Um, how do we balance out this concept that you have to pay for those things or you don't get them? Um, you do have poor people and I think they should be supplemented, maybe totally paid, but there has to be an arrangement so that this is true. Water in particular in the city of Detroit for decades um, would never cost anyone what it was required to replace the plumbing, the pipes, um, the infrastructure that was required to give us all water. They finally figured this out a few years back and started charging all of us. I live in Livonia, mm -hmm. uh, Royal Oak, Detroit, Oakland County, wherever. 
And what they did as part of that is they, they shut off the water supply from people who were number one, too poor to pay for it, but also for people who just didn't bother to pay for it. Right. So if, um, look, I work for a variety of homeless activities. Um, I get it with poor people, but if you're gonna have this conversation with Republicans in particular, Mm -hmm. with business people who run these organizations, you have to get real with them and say, um, some people need to pay. Those that don't um, need charity. Let's figure out who they are. Um, and then, um, you know, like I say, there's really four utilities, including water, that you have to, um, you have to help people out on. Um, my last comment would be um, a phrase that I've heard a number of times is that Democrats press for a conversation, uh, Republicans press to win. Um, when I look at that three letter word that says win, the key to all this to me is uh, to get the vote out. If people want a future, they need to vote for it. And instead of changing the mind of people who are in positions of power today, get enough people understanding what the issues are and get rid of them because we need people in there that are gonna have a future for us. Um, anyway, a part of that is obviously having the conversation. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. it, thank you. Thanks for your time. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um... Lots, lots to respond to there, but um, you made some really um, awesome points and really talked about a lot of things that I spend my days thinking about and working on. So, um, uh, yeah, so I definitely appreciate um, the conversation about utility bills, um, and that's actually um, something that we've been working on for a while, but something that we're really uh, especially hyper-focused on right now um, as, you know, the the pandemic is happening and, um, you know, a lot, we've, uh, a lot of utilities have, you know, decided to stop uh, with shutoffs for the duration of the pandemic, but um, almost none of them have said that they will be reducing or forgiving bills that are not paid during this time, which is obviously a huge problem given um, the huge amount of unemployment happening right now. Um, and so um, there are, you know, a lot of different ways to think about this. Um, a model that um, we're really interested in um, working on uh, and we're, you know, in, in the process of working on is uh, a percent of income um, based payment model um, as opposed to based on usage so you know your a percentage of your income is allocated for your electricity bill your water bill um, and, and that's how much you're charged as opposed to based on how much you use um, which you know we believe is something that uh, would be a lot fairer and would stop a lot of the shutoffs that are happening um, but there are also um, you know you talk about uh, this vicious cycle that is one of the huge reasons why justice is so important when we're talking about this in that you know these communities uh you know can't afford to pay the high enough bills to cover the cost of updating their infrastructure and often those are the communities that already have the worst infrastructure because they haven't had the money to update it um and so um there are a few different um things we need to do uh, in Michigan, one of the biggest things is get our taxes back in order. Um, back in 2011, um, we had a huge restructuring where um, uh, corporations are paying less in taxes than um, the taxpayers, um, the average citizens. Um, and that's a, a huge problem and something that has continued. Um, and so, you know, right now, uh, revenue sharing, which is what, what is called what it's called when uh, it, the money that the state gives to municipalities um, is uh, lower than it's supposed to be right now because of um, the budget's really complicated but a, a huge part of that is because of how um, lax we are on taxing corporations and on also also on fining them um, for when they're uh, violating our environmental laws um, 
And so, you know, we need to deal with all of that to, so that municipalities can be getting more money from the state. That's one thing. Um, another thing is um, there's a, a related water issue um, of uh, water bottlers. Um, obviously, Nestle is the biggest one, but there are actually 27 bottling companies that take water from the Great Lakes in Michigan um, and sell it all over the country. Um, and so we have been um, for a couple of years now and are, are, you know, making headway in pieces, um, but are, have been working on a long term campaign um, to uh, establish a, a fee structure, um, because right now those bottling companies pay about $200 a year in permit fees to take um, millions of gallons of our water, um, which is detrimental to our aquifers, um, but also, you know, theft. Uh, and so uh, we want to implement a um, fee structure where they would pay for the water, but we want that, uh, that money to be put into a specific <laughs> fund designated for things like environmental cleanups, infrastructure updates, um, things like that. So, you know, those are just a couple of the policy solutions that we're pursuing. Um, it's all very complicated. I, like Andrew was talking about net zero, I could talk about it for hours, so I won't do that. Um, but yeah, those are a couple of the, the ways that we're working to provide. So it sounds to me like, um people are um, sound supportive of this plan and looking for ways that they can help uh, get it approved by the commissioners. Is that, I'm seeing some nodding heads. Um, so one thing folks can do is host a meeting like this with their group, their neighborhood, their whatever group they're in to get more people to be knowledgeable about it. Another thing obviously is sign the petition and um, I'm thinking we need to get organized about um, setting up meetings with commissioners. Is it is it a good time to start doing that, Andrew? Uh, yeah. Okay. We, I mean, we can work on that via BUC and some of the people that I know are very um, passionate on these issues and uh, would make good um, folks to go do these meetings if, if you want us to do that. Yeah, definitely. I, Definitely. I think we also should um, maybe add a tab to um, our spreadsheet or have some way to track those meetings so that we know we know which commissioners have heard about the platform. But um, yeah, that's absolutely. Um, I would love to, to ask, do most of or all of you know who your county commissioner is? Like, no, no, that's the thing. I think we need a list, a yeah. coordinated list uh, from you of who all the commissioners are and uh, what areas they represent. I have that list, Annis. I, oh, I look do. up who your commissioner is. <laughs> huh? yeah. Do you have that? Yeah, I do. But is that something that the whole congregation can have? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. If you go to if you Oakland if you go to oakgov.com. Um, they've got a place you just type in your address and it tells you who your commissioner is. I would just think for the purposes of getting our groups involved, it would be nice to have that for all the commissioners, for all the districts they represent uh, in Oakland County so we can present it to our congregation so each person will know who to contact. Yeah, good idea. Good idea, Anna. that we help well, you know, we've done that with state advocacy and the, mm -hmm. we've been pretty much told that the state advocacy we're doing isn't going anyplace. So this Oakland County Commission advocacy is more local and we need to be more local always. So uh, it sounds like a good way to do it, just following the same principles. Absolutely. So I can, I yeah. can set up a, a tracking form so that when people, you know, schedule a meeting that we'll know about it. And um, if you all want to, and I'll get with you later, um, if you want Andrew or Meredith or any of the other team to go along, I'm sure they'll be happy to do that. Um, but I, I know a couple of people on the screen here are perfectly competent to do that on their own. Yeah, and I mean, I'll say, um, so I think we're, we're in a great spot to meet. Um, just to give you guys an idea of what we'll probably be doing down the road, um, you know, which we could definitely use your help with in the summer um, and as well is, you know, it's really going to depend 
a lot on how these county commissioners are responding to a lot of our advocacy. So once we've had these meetings um, and we've had a chance to get return to normal, um, there will probably be additional asks from the campaign. I mean, right now I can't say anything for sure, but you know, we're probably going to need people to come out and attend county commission meetings when this uh, legislation is up for an actual vote. Um, if we can't get the legislation up for an actual vote, we may need to hold some kind of a press conference um, in front of the county building or something. So uh, definitely appreciate any support that can be given in terms of meeting with county commissioners. And I would just encourage folks, look down the road you know, for a message from us. Um, if you want to subscribe to our email list, I'm sure Jane can, can hook you up, but we're definitely going to need that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we're really trying to see some, some major progress over the next seven months. So we've kind of done like a seven month campaign. I think we'll reassess at the end and see where we are, but you know, there's definitely going to be some, um, some in-person stuff once we get back to normal too. So am I, am I correct in what I looked up? Every single commissioner gets reelected every term. So in November, the whole commission is up. No, I don't think so. No, I don't think they all get reelected every term. Because when I look through them, all the terms, when I look through the list, I'm sorry, go ahead, Keith. Yeah, I think you're correct. Okay. Um, seems which to which is correct. Bad way to run a railroad, but. I'm pretty sure, yeah, every district is up. Every, every district, two years. I, yeah, yeah. actually, I'm, I, I don't know why I'm saying pretty sure. I'm positive. Or <laughs> I've been in contact with all, all of the, yes, all of the commissioners are. So would it be worthwhile for someone to work on the campaign of someone that we want to, that is support? That would yeah. be another. No. So yeah. I, we're in the process, we're in our endorsement process right now. So um, Clean Water Action, uh, we have both a 501c4 and a 501c3, which means that we um, can do uh, endorsements of uh, elected officials and, and you know, work um, to support their campaign. We can't coordinate with their campaign at all. That's um, not allowed, but we can, you know, say that we support uh, a candidate. And so uh, we are planning on doing that for county commissioners. Um, so we have a questionnaire um, that we've had filled out by I'd say at least 10 of, uh, uh, maybe probably more, um, mm -hmm. of the candidates who are running. And so fairly soon we'll be making some decisions on um, who we're going to endorse. And I don't think we'll endorse in every district, but, um, but we'll, you know, some of the strongest uh, uh, candidates. So we'll certainly be, um, you know, looking for folks to support that work. Um, yeah. Does Sierra Club also endorse county commissioners? Yes. Um, for legal purposes, I have no opinion on which commissioners are better than any other commissioners, but <laughs> Um, we have the same thing, and uh, we, we've we've been, I have shared the platform with the political team. They're under no obligation to listen to me because we're not coordinating. But they have incorporated many of the points from the platform into our candidate questionnaire. Yes, so yeah. a lot of the uh, candidates will be getting asked about the kind of things we're talking about, and we'll be they'll be assessing them based on uh, on those criteria. Yeah, ours as well. One more question is, Anna, you asked at the beginning, I, I just was unclear on what your question was. If this goes through and there's a sustainability office created, yes. I don't believe that, uh, were you asking if Andrew and or Meredith- I was just trying to figure out what the lines of advocacy were. And the very first thing I heard discussed on the list of wants and needs was uh, a sustainability, a place uh, where they could coordinate at an actual office. And I was just trying to figure out space. Yeah, how the advocacy uh, was going to work. Um, but I think I've got a, a better idea now of how that's going to go. Yeah, so we unfortunately don't have offices. I don't know, Sierra Club doesn't have an, any office. No, I, I have an office in Ferndale. You're oh. all welcome to visit, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess the other part of it was, okay, when we came to the meeting on February 24th, we met two commissioners, one of whom had proposed this. I can't remember her name. What is her name? Nelson. Nelson. Okay. She's in charge of all this. Isn't she in charge of all this advocacy or not? No. No. Nope, she was just invited. She's, she's an ally. She's just supportive. Yeah. 
but she proposed the the thing I'm looking at the the uh, climate emergency resolution. The the uh, Oakland County Climate Jobs and Justice Platform was her under her endorsement, wasn't it? Uh, no, that was us that drafted that. She wrote a resolution to declare a climate emergency in Oakland County. Okay, yeah. but so, we we wrote the platform. So how do you how does your role uh, compare with her role in advocacy here? Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to figure out how she fits into this. Yeah, uh, totally. it's her plan. Do you coordinate everything with her? It's not her plan. It's not her plan. Sierra Club, Clean Water Action, all these nonprofits oh, wrote the plan. It's their plan. She's a commissioner. She's she has, a commissioner. Oh, okay. But she, she did have that other um, emergency declaration. That's why I was confused. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the yeah. resolution was a separate uh, thing, which, I mean, is a great thing that definitely sets an important stage for this platform. But, yeah, the platform was developed separately, and she came to the event because she is supportive of climate action and, and of the platform um but she was not involved in creating it okay yeah and one thing i kind of want to say i think uh you know something i probably should have said in the political context of this is that you know they passed the climate emergency resolution because they knew they wanted to do something about climate um the oakland county commission like they had a new commission they had a new county executive yeah. they wanted to do they wanted to check that environmental box you know, what, the reason we have a lot of leverage is because that resolution is very vague. I mean, it says there's an emergency. It says we have to do something about it. But what we've done with our platform is provide an actual vision, yeah. which they haven't even got it. Like, that, that is where they're trying to be. They were going to try and be in June, you know, is to actually have an idea of what they wanted to do. So what we kind of did when we started this campaign, because we knew that that was going to happen, is we preempted those internal conversations and took control of the conversation and said, this is what the community wants the environmental vision to look like. So what we're kind of doing is Krista, uh, Commissioner Nelson helped to get the issue going, but what we're kind of doing is like setting the framework and like, yeah. you know, yeah. steering the demands. Yeah. And when you say we, you're speaking for the Sierra Club or what are you speaking for when you say we? Everyone uh, involved in the campaign, I would say. Yeah. What? Everyone involved in the campaign. So that's the organizers to, you know, us who have the campaign for well, also, climate jobs and justice platform. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So all of you would be, you know, if you decide to. What is the name of your organization? Uh, so the campaign is called the Oakland County Climate Campaign. Oh, but okay. It's Thank made you. Up of multiple organizations. Yeah. Oh, okay. I got it. Coalition. By the way, we've changed our. Our slogan or our tagline from make Oakland County green to turn Oakland County green. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can figure out why. <laughs> Maybe it's green already. It's just we're the ones who aren't green. Excuse me. I'm <laughs> being <laughs> um, yeah, and there was one other thing I wanted to add on the, the elected officials question, what Andrew was talking about um, with setting the framework. Um, a lot of the time, especially on the local level, what elected officials need is like guidance, expertise, and ideas more than being persuaded. You know, like there are a lot of commissioners who would be happy to support climate legislation, but it has to be written and introduced. And, um, you know, county commissioners don't have the same type of staff as, say, a state legislature legislator or a federal legislator um you know they don't have like policy staff who are working full-time researching and writing bills mm -hmm. uh, and so uh a, a lot of the time at the local level what they need is you know like what we're doing uh is the the ideas and how to get there um even more than the pressure there are certainly some that need to be you know convinced or at least be pushed to be really strong advocates for it. But a lot of them are on board. They just are, don't have the expertise to write the legislation we need to actually take action. So then you see, you see that yourselves then as a resource, is that correct? Oh yeah. 
for sure. And you're offering them a resource rather than an argument in that sense. Yeah, I think it's sort of, it's a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah. For the county climate emergency resolution, whatever it's called, um, I'm assuming we have, uh, how overwhelmingly did that get voted in? Um, do we know who didn't, who voted against it? I don't off the top of my head, but. I thought it was party, but I, I can go back and check. Yeah, I feel like it I mean, we could all individually, but that would be repeating. Yeah. yeah it was non-binding, so I mean, it didn't really do anything. Right, just... right. But I know I'm in White Lake Township, which is Eileen Kowal, uh -huh. and the Kowals have owned White Lake Township. Two oh. brothers, Eileen, for 35 years. <laughs> um, Barbara with the dingles. Yeah, well, and it's commissioner township supervisor they just share the spots uh senator uh state senator um mm -hmm. it, it just kind of keeps rotating the same people and i would imagine they're not environmentally friendly um so i was curious as to where they stood on that or where where eileen stands on that i haven't talked to eileen um mike kowal i talked to a while back and yeah he's not he's not very environmental so <laughs> right, right. he's talking about recycling his his idea of recycling was turning tires back into oil um was what i talked with him about so uh but yeah i i don't know off the top of my head but i would imagine there's not yeah, a lot the last support. time i met with him he was so proud that they're expanding the width of 75. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, but when you talk to people like that about the lakes and how important that they are for tourism and yeah. like the algae growth on the lakes is a very bipartisan issue. Karen and I have talked yeah. about that. Uh, that's your commonality. You find the thing that you're commonly concerned about. Uh, tend not with more conservative people to use the word environmental at all. Not a good idea. Um, find some other way to talk about it. What you have in common is you love those lakes up there. Yeah, right. I also think the economic argument is pretty yeah. important. It is, yeah. it, it, water contamination is bad for the economy. Like, yeah, bad for tourism. Flooding is bad for the economy. <laughs> all the <laughs> increased health, sickness rates is bad for the, you know, all of these things are not, in the long term, they're going to tank everything that Republicans like. Are, are any of you familiar with um, something? I think the Sierra Club sent out an email. It's probably four or five weeks ago now, um, asking us to pay attention to a change that was being made in how the, the fund for, you know, for the bottle deposits that we pay, the unclaimed. So if I pay my 10 cents and I don't, I don't turn that bottle back in, I don't get my 10 cents back. Mm -hmm. And that fund, part of that fund was going toward cleanup mm -hmm. throughout our state. And there, there was a proposal, it was already happening change to, um, I don't remember the details now, but it was, it was looking like you could take away the money. Can you, can you comment on that, Meredith? Sounds like you're familiar with it. Yeah, I am. And I, uh, I hate to say our legislative and policy director, I wish he was here right now because he knows uh, up, up and down what was going on. But um, uh, the, I know the bill that was up, uh, yes, would cut some of the, the cleanup funding. Um, but uh, we were negotiating for uh, an increase in, in something else in Eagle, um, which is the environmental agency in Michigan. Um, but I, I don't know. They were going to give more of the money back to the, the retailers and the, or the wholesalers. Right. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to remember what version of it passed because it changed uh, multiple times before it went up for a vote. There was like a, a huge contentious amount of, um, I kind of forgot about it because I wanted to try to find out, well, what then was going to happen with all the cleanup needs that we have in our state. Yeah, um, yeah, we're actually currently working on a, a polluter pay campaign um, to, you know, change the law um, back to what actually what we had in the early 90s, which is polluters are required to pay for cleanup because they're the ones who 
you know, do the pollution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's a, a huge thing that we're, uh, that's our really our most forward facing statewide campaign right now. Um, but I'm trying to see if it, yeah, I think it did pass, but what version of it passed? Sorry. Uh, So it's uh, 840, it's 850, it's almost nine. So, um, oh my gosh. Yeah. So <laughs> I can, we can work together on um, just seeing who wants to go visit their commissioner and, and, and work together on figuring that out. And uh, I'll send you all the petition so you can sign it and um, go from there. Yeah, so I'd say reply to Jane's email or, you know, y'all I know know how to get in touch with each other and then yeah Jane let us know and we can whatever help is needed um yeah I want to say it's encouraging to see the environmental work going on uh when so much is closed down uh because of the uh, pandemic it's been hard to kind of get a handle on the environmental work again and this has been very helpful as a meeting well speaking of I mean I hope somebody figures out just the right way um, to make the point that you know, scientists are predicting that as the permafrost thaws, that it's going to release ancient pathogens and viruses. Yeah. And we now know what might happen. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's an opportunity, there's going to be a window of opportunity here to help get people's attention on that. Yeah. That, okay, we have time to get ready for that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, these issues are not at all separate. Um, I'm actually working on a blog post on the blog right now about how the, uh, you know, the, the high rates of asthma and cancer oh, yeah. in Detroit are directly as a result of the same pollution that's causing climate right. change and are also the, the other result is the high coronavirus rates and death so yeah all of this is very connected so yeah thanks for great that. all right yeah, um i mean the other thing i would just add is beyond permafrost uh dethawing and um you know some of those factors there is just the general factor that um you know the way we treat the planet deforestation um you know massive increases in population in some areas with very poor zoning um you know the way people are handling wildlife um you know, those three factors are going to combine. And actually, I had a person who's a professor of environmental health at Oakland University share with me an article from 2012 called The Ecology of Disease, which uh, is in the New York Times. And it correctly predicted the economic impact that it was going to come from bats and that it was likely going to oh come gosh, from really? uh, the preparation and, yeah, and uh, handling of bats. So this is something we've known about for a long time. And these ecologists are um, saying the probability is going to go up the more we deforest the planet and the more we um, take away wildlife habitat. So I think there's a lot of scary parallels, but not things that are unsolvable if we, um, if we have the will. So We've got to be a little bit careful, at least those of us in the citizens' climate lobby have had a couple of notes. Uh, when using the pandemic to urge people into environmental action. We've got to be a little careful with that. Um, I think the way Andrew expressed it was very good. I mean, I guess it was Mary Jo about, well, there will be pathogens and we now will be getting up an infrastructure to deal better with pathogens. But any, and I don't think any of us would do this, but, but any language of, well, this has shown us is yeah. not considered suitable by the citizens climate lobby. Anyway, oh, we have to we have to be very careful. I, I write letters to the editor and op eds, and I, I've had to be very very careful about that. Yeah, sort of not not a we told you so. Uh, um. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody for uh, coming and spending so much time. I'm really excited about us being able to help make this plan go forward and you'll get an email from me.